On the first warm day of a 1990s spring, I was lifted by the sight of birds of prey spiralling above the long Mind hills and began writing fondly about the buzzard line, a frontier that in those days stretched from lowland Scotland down into Dorset. Those meditative shapes above the hills were a sure sign one had passed into the west. They were as defining markers as cider and slate. I was some way into this rhapsodic blarney before I realised I was defending a kind of natural ghetto. Buzzards had only been western creatures for 150 years, driven out of the rest of Britain by the game bird industry. They weren't immemorial local totems, just hapless refugees. How times have changed. Despite an unreconstructed shooting community, buzzards have spread back across their natural range in Britain. We see them over our house in Norfolk most weeks. One surprised friend saw a young bird with more ambition and strength offload a live leveret onto her kitchen roof. That sense of locality, local distinctiveness, can be an ambivalent value in nature, just as in other contexts. Often it's the authentic existential state of natural systems, the tangy braiding of geology, climate and organism, in one special way, in one particular place. The living things resist confinement, especially by human categories, and the darker side of natural localism is the closing of mental and physical borders, the exclusive mutterings about the way we do things here. Where wild things properly belong has always been a shifting, disputed state. In the first week of a later spring, four of us decided on a mad whim to circumnavigate the West Country in five days instead of fleeing to the Med, as we usually did. We weren't exactly seeking some transcendental essence of westerliness, but hoped for a few of those magic moments when harmonious regional tone is gate-crashed by the wild card. We set out from Dorset bound for Cornwall and snaked amongst the labyrinth of tidal creeks that fray the foul estuary. But we missed by a few days what would have been a true local meteor, something not to be seen anywhere else in Britain. At the highest tide on the spring equinox, salt water rises up into the River Rhine Oakwoods, so that you can have the disorientating vision of primroses flowering underwater. When I first saw this inundation, kaolin from the China clay quarries was still being pumped into the river, and the primroses were lapped by Cornish cream. But we were on time for the wild daffodils along the River Tain, miles of them in drifts and tufts and rivulets, the very same species that William and Dorothy Wordsworth had seen in the Lake District on April the 15th, 1802. They weren't dancing like the Lakeland bunch, but even motionless, I don't think they have a rival as the most sharply beautiful wildflowers in Britain. The soft primrose yellow of the rough, the way the six petals of them are slightly cupped round the trumpet, the pertness of them, the lean of one stalk away from the other. Some gardening writers still insist that anything as elegant as this must be a cultivated escape. But John Gerard described them as common everywhere in England in the 16th century. The pubs in the city of London were decked out with them at Easter. The wild daff, the lent lily, is another depleted native elbowed west. We moved east through North Exmoor, new territory to me, but its dirt lanes and wild woodland reminding me of Appalachia. It was thick with beech. These trees, native where I grew up in the Chilterns, are introduced here, but are so corkscrewed and folded into the cranky contours that they look totally at home and are flourishing in the increasingly mild, damp springs. Natural England regards beech here as an invasive alien, so is clearing self sown trees from Dartmoor Oakwoods, because they don't belong just here. As if the world outside had any time for such ecological puritanism. Our last lap home was through the Somerset levels, and in a moment of sublime serendipity, we heard the baroque trumpeting and then saw the lift-off of nearly 50 cranes, their seven-foot wind crown making it seem as if they were sculling through the air. A hundred of these birds, reintroduced via continental eggs after an absence of four centuries, another symbol of the level's rehabilitation. In Norfolk, 
Cranes arrived of their own accord in 1979. But anyone who sees these awesome creatures, ancient residents driven to extinction, returned as stopped-off migrants and then as reintroductions, will find it hard to quibble about their proper place. Cranes are also beginning to return to the fens, that huge area of flatland just inland from the wash. The fen country is a supreme example of an area of intense local distinctiveness which became a barren ghetto and is now reviving again. In the Middle Ages, it was a rich eco-region, a vast swamp abounding with bitterns, otters, fish eagles, where the inhabitants lived in houses on stilts and followed an almost hunter-gatherer existence, preying on fish and wildfowl. From the 15th century, it was progressively drained and turned into ploughland. It still has a powerful aura dictated by the imperatives of sky, wind and water. But it's now an impoverished landscape, its old liveliness ploughed and sprayed into oblivion. It's a bleakness that affects people as well as nature. I've seen scores of black-dressed women hunched over the potato crop like a vision of the worst times of the 19th century agricultural depression. And a few hundred yards away, signs warning passers-by to stay off the fields because of the deadly poisons. A precocious writer in 1899 saw a vision that would be apposite today. All is now gone. Reeds, sedges, the glittering water, the butterflies. And in its place, a dreary flat of black land, with hardly a jack snipe to give the charm and characteristic attraction. But people have loved and still love this place. The poet John Clare did, even after the first stages of its enforced enclosure and modernisation had helped drive him mad. It's a measure of just how vital locality is to us that we cling to and can get comfort from the slightest shadows and echoes of the old spirit of a place. The challenge in a world where the differences between native and stranger are fading is to discover veins of local character which are distinctive without being insular and withdrawn.